Welcome to Worship Faith Community, friends and family. It's good to be back after a weekend away visiting my other sister who lives in Tennessee and my brother who lives in Tennessee. And to worship with them last weekend and spend time with them was truly a joy. Guess what? Their new senior pastor interviewed here for a worship position about six years ago and then eventually ended up out there, ended up being their worship pastor and then their senior pastor. So how about that? What a small world it is. And he was preaching on Ephesians 3 last weekend and I'll be preaching on Ephesians 3 next weekend. Dylan's preaching on Ephesians 2 this weekend. So again, what a small world world it is. And I was reminded of, of what a joy it is to be able to connect online as well, which I did last weekend also. And I was reminded that the new front door of the church truly is not always the front door of our building. Really, the front door of the church today oftentimes is our online worship. So we're, we're, we're so grateful and so blessed that we're able to offer this, this online worship and to be able to connect with you there. We trust that you are blessed. We believe that God has brought us together in this way. So welcome to worship this weekend. So again, in the midst of a world in which it's so hard to agree on everything, hard to agree on politics, hard to agree on music, hard to agree on schedules, the creeds are such a blessing as they remind us of what's most important in our faith and what it is that we can all agree on. So please join me as we begin our worship by confessing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, welcome to our worship. Welcome, Faith family. We are glad that you are joining us online. Let's sing together, Only King Forever. Shoot. 
Father, thank you for welcoming us us into your family, inviting us in to be a part of what you're doing in this world. Uh, Father, it is hard to understand how the world works and the chaos that happens on a regular basis, but God, we we know we can stand firm in trusting in you, handing over our worries, our frustrations, and also our joys and excitements to you, knowing that they come from you, And knowing that you can help lift our burdens when we are in it, when we're in the middle of a storm. So we just are grateful for uh, the opportunity to commune with you, that you send your spirit to be with us. Send your spirit right now, Lord, to be in our hearts, to open us up to the words that you've laid on Pastor Dylan's heart. Uh, God, I truly believe that um, there's power in the words you've laid on him this week. And I just pray that you would open us up to what we need to hear 
Um, I think it'll be challenging for all of us. And so I just pray that you would open us up to it, that you would not, that you would help break the guard down, the walls that we build up around ourselves so that we can hear you speak, so we can hear how you desire to move us forward, to grow, to grow closer to you and to grow into the better version of ourselves and as Christians here in our world, in our, in our city, in our state, and in our country. Um, so God, we just give you this time. We give you this space. It's yours, and we pray that you would do a powerful work inside of us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. I don't see you, but it's good to be here with you online. Uh, and I do have to say, I didn't plan on this, but we're recording this at, uh, let's see here, 3.59 p.m. on Wednesday, not to give away the magic, uh, but it is storming like crazy right now outside the church. So we'll see. Maybe that's uh, a little bit indicative of how this message is going to go, but you can let me know after the fact. You can just email me, dylan.fclc at gmail.org and let me know how it goes. So, Because I think we're going to get a little, maybe a little uncomfortable today. And I remember a pastor once said to me that the gospel makes the uncomfortable comfortable and the comfortable uncomfortable. Uh, so I think we're going to test that theory just a little bit today. And we have to leave it to the Apostle Paul to give us the letters that kind of knock us down a peg, but also cause us to have hope. And he doesn't pull his punches when it comes to Ephesians. So please know that I'm walking with all of you into this hard topic and that the words I speak come from a place of love, both for you and for God's church. And I recently read an article in Christianity Today that fits the concerns of Ephesians 2. It was from a pastor who found himself in the middle of a church split. Pastor Emmett had taken over a senior pastor after beloved senior pastor Doug had retired from decades of faithful service to Grace Fellowship. Pastor Emmett had been serving as the adult education pastor for several years when the transition happened. And at first, everyone was overjoyed at the smooth transition. The future was bright. Pastor Emmett was well-loved and well-respected. But things slowly began to shift. You see, there were people in the church who didn't like Emmett, and some were prominent members. These prominent members felt their power was in jeopardy now that Pastor Doug had retired. As Pastor Emmett put it, these people felt their membership, relationship to the founder, or financial means gave them some sort of carte blanche in exerting control in the church. And exerting power and control is exactly what they did. At every turn, they undermined Pastor Emmett's leadership, not because of any biblical or theological issues, but because they didn't want to lose their power. The result was a church that was torn apart. And from what I can tell, Pastor Emmett only lasted five years as senior pastor because of these intense divisions. When you read this story, it's as if he was pastoring two different churches in one congregation. And sadly, Pastor Emmett does not stand alone in this experience. And the worst part of it is the self-inflicted damage the church deals itself in these circumstances. Disunity in the church is one of the gravest threats to its health and existence. And I'm sure no one's going to be surprised at this, but the Apostle Paul was very aware of this issue. And we'll be looking at Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 today. And at the core of this passage is the non-negotiable essential of unity in the church. And this unity isn't superficial, all right? It's not a, you have your space, I have mine. No, this unity flows from the unity we have with Christ, which gives us the strength to have meaningful fellowship, and dare I say, to have healthy disagreements and a spirit of love. Now, if you hear nothing else from me today, Please hear this one big idea. Paul is saying, the church is united in Christ to bring glory to God. Our unity in Christ is not about getting what we want, always getting our way, or as Pastor Emmett said it, having carte blanche and exerting our power in the church. 
Our unity is about bringing glory to God. In order to do that, I can assure you, we'll have to sacrifice to some degree on most of what we want. But that is a good thing. And I hope, very sincerely hope, I can convince you of that today. And before we jump into the text, I'm going to take us on what I'm calling a history is helpful journey. My history is helpful trademark application is still pending, all right? But I'm holding on to hope, all right? So Ephesus was the most important city in Western Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. It had a harbor that opened into the Castor River, which in turn emptied into the Aegean Sea. Because it was also at an intersection of major trade routes, Ephesus became a commercial center. It boasted a pagan temple dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis, which Paul actually got in deep water with in Acts 19, 23 through 41. Knowing the huge evangelistic opportunity, Paul made Ephesus his center for evangelism for about three years. Ephesus was a majorly important mission field for the early church. So when Paul writes to Ephesus, you'd expect it to sound a lot like his other letters, but it doesn't at all. It's not filled with a bunch of corrections of errors like we have with Romans or Corinthians. With Paul and Timothy ministering there for years, they hadn't fallen into the same traps as those other churches. So scholars actually see Ephesians as more circulatory, kind of like a catechism like we have in the Lutheran church. If someone was new to the church, you'd hand them this letter. And Paul, at the writing of Ephesians around 62 AD, was sitting in jail in Rome, as he was clearly a huge fan of being in jail. He's surely going to die soon. So the question that comes to mind is this. Why did Paul feel the need to write this circulatory letter to such a well-taught church? One scholar gave a perfect answer to this. He said, now is the time for the student to reflect on the overarching purpose of the teaching becoming a church created in Jesus Christ and in the glory of God. Like any good teacher, Paul knows the most dangerous pitfalls for his students. The church being divided is at the top of that list. So his parting remarks are aimed at giving the Ephesians a vision of what it looks like to be a mature church. This vision is also aimed at the storms of division that can appear at any moment in any church. And the most dangerous ones are those that brew within the walls of the church because they not only divide us, but they take away from the mission of glorifying God. That is the concern underlying his words in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So let's turn to Ephesians 2 now and start in verses 11 and 12. Starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. If we just read verses 11 through 12, we could miss the larger point Paul is making. Back in verse 3, he says this, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh means our sinful nature and all the ways it comes to life. Paul is saying, we're all in this together. None of us can call ourselves special or holy. No one gets a pass. This would have been a very provocative statement by Paul to the first century Jewish Christian ears. Sure, they realized their sin, but it wasn't like the sin of the Gentiles. They failed to live up to the covenant, but they weren't depraved like those heathen Gentiles. They may say, we're not part of them in your statement, Paul. Paul replies, nice try. We absolutely were depraved like those Gentiles. And all of us here today, we are also plagued by our cravings of the flesh, our sinful nature, the me-centric mentality. But thank God for his mercy. 
Look at what Paul says in verses 4 through 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We have been saved. We no longer live at the mercy of our sinful human nature, but by the mercy of God. What bound us has been broken, and we are now bound to Christ. So when we get to verses 11 through 12, Paul is using our reconciliation with Christ, being bound to Christ, as a starting point for our reconciliation and unification with one another. There was a lot of friction in the early church between Jews and Gentiles. Circumcision for the Jews was a significant point of pride. It was the mark that they were God's covenant people, which started back with Abraham. They were set apart as God's representatives to the world. And on the other hand, the Gentiles were not the children of the promise. They were foreign heathens excluded from Israel. As Paul says, they were without hope and without God. So you can imagine what it was like when the uncircumcised Gentile heathens suddenly started showing up and saying they're children of God too. It was a recipe for conflict because many Jewish Christians still thought that Gentiles needed to convert to Judaism first before they could accept Christ. And Paul had dealt with that argument in every church he ministered to. And though we aren't first century Jews and Gentiles, there is still this looming danger of division among us. And that danger hinges on a very important thing, our identity. The Jewish Christians had great fear that if their tradition wasn't maintained, it would all fall apart. The Gentiles had great fear that those traditions would be unnecessarily forced upon them. The Jewish Christian identity was rooted in that tradition. The Gentile identity rejected any need for the tradition. Now, tradition or no tradition wasn't the issue. What became the issue was when either stance replaced Christ as the core identity, which clearly happened in most first century churches in some form. So both groups ended up falling into the sin of division because their tradition or lack of tradition became their idol and identity. The way they did things was the truth. Andy Stanley, who many of you might know, he's a famous author and pastor, has a story that I think demonstrates how this attitude undercuts our unity in Christ and the mission to bring glory to God. And this is how Andy shares his story in his book, Deep and Wide. He says, when I was 26 years old, I convinced the deacons at my dad's church to let me host a citywide evangelistic event for teenagers. They were on the edge of their seats as I explained my plans. They loved my idea of asking other churches in the area to bring kids from their student ministries to our one-night event. Everybody thought the event was a great idea until they experienced it. They stood around the back of the sanctuary while 2,000 somewhat rowdy teenagers were entertained by not the choir and orchestra. As they described it later, it was irreverent and unruly. They were disturbed by what they saw taking place on the very spot where God's word is preached every Sunday. And as one gentleman put it to Andy, that's not who we are. I look, Andy says, I looked at the gentleman who made that comment and asked, did you see the close to 200 kids who came forward to pray with a counselor and give their lives to Christ? I'll never forget his response. You could have done it without that music. 200 students confessed faith in Jesus Christ that night. 200 saved to the glory of God. But despite that, there was a lack of celebration and unification because, according to one of the deacons, that's not who we are. When our preferences trump the proclamation, we've lost our way. When our culture becomes Christ, we've lost our way. When our liturgy, traditional or contemporary, becomes our Lord, we've lost our way. Paul is saying 
being a circumcised Jew or uncircumcised Gentile isn't your identity anymore. Your identity now is being united in Christ to bring glory to God. At whatever point we disagree today, this is also true for us. So I want to ask the hard questions in light of Andy Stanley's story and Paul's words. How much are we willing to sacrifice for the proclamation of the gospel? How willing are we to set aside our preferences for the sake of being brothers and sisters united in Christ, bringing glory to God? How committed are we to being a body of believers rather than believers who gather as a body? There is a difference. These are challenging questions for all of us, myself included. And we're going to need some serious divine help to answer them. Thankfully, we have that. So let's turn now to Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. There is no gap so wide that the cross can't cover it. Let me say that again. There is no gap so wide that the cross can't cover it. In the cross, we were reconciled to God. In the cross, we received the peace of Christ. In the cross, the barrier of hostility was destroyed. In the cross, enemies became siblings. In the cross, we received access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. In the cross, we find salvation. And in the cross, we have an eternal life spent glorifying God. That is the center of our unity. We may have a mountain of preferences. We will even argue over those preferences. But it all disappears in the shadow of the cross. And hear me clearly. Our traditions our liturgies, our cultural preferences are important, but they are never more important than the cross. Because when the cross truly grasps our minds, our hearts, and our souls, nothing can hold a candle to its majesty. And that is what I want to invite all of us to do today. I want all of us to take a second and look at the cross. We're going to have one on the screen. Take all those things which divide us, that cause hostility, that attempt to drive a wedge in our unity, that want to destroy our fellowship as believers. No matter how big or small they are, take those things and put them up against the cross. And we're going to sit in silence for just a few seconds. And I want you to reflect on how the cross responds to these differences. Is the cross enough? Is it enough to give us the strength to place the proclamation over our preferences? Is it enough with our sea of opinions to unite us in Christ, to bring glory to God? It absolutely is. In 1992, Joe Avila killed Amy Wall in a drunk driving accident. After the accident, Joe fled the scene. When he came to, he was being booked for second-degree murder at the Fresno County Jail. And just before Easter of 1993, Joe entered the courthouse and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. And during this time, he became a believer and began serving the prison's hospice patients and preaching the gospel. After his release, Joe became deeply involved at his local church. 
Not long after, Joe's mentor called him. Rick Wall, Amy's father, the girl that he killed, wanted to see Joe. Rick had been watching Joe's progress from a distance this entire time. And when they met, Rick told Joe about the two days a year he visits Amy's grave on her birthday and the anniversary of her death. And then Rick said, Joe, I know what you've been doing for a long time now even when you were in prison, and I approve of it. Joe's prayers for reconciliation were being answered. And Joe admitted it was painful to seek forgiveness from the walls, but he knew God could use the situation for his glory if he did. Later, Joe and Derek, Amy's brother, were asked to participate in a restorative justice council event in front of hundreds of people. The night of the event, Amy's father approached Joe, hugged him, and said, I love you, Joe. Trying to contain his emotion, Joe shared, I killed his daughter, and he was able to give me a hug and say, I love you. And that is a true testament to the miracle of reconciliation and why Christ died on the cross. So I'll ask again, is the cross enough? If Christ can reconcile and unite a murderer and the victim's family, then there is no limit to the power of the cross. This power is what unites us, bringing us together as children of God. It destroys all barriers that cause hostility. It reconciles us by the Holy Spirit when we find ourselves completely at odds with each other. And the results are amazing when this happens. It brings glory to God. So let's finish today's passage with Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, which says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We were all sinners in need of a savior. We have that savior because of God's mercy. Though we were once excluded outsiders, we have been brought in and united with Christ. This same power unites us with one another. Consequently, we are brothers and sisters, fellow citizens, held together by the cornerstone to be a holy temple in the Lord. And what is the function of a holy temple? To praise and proclaim the glory of God. All that has happened, our adoption by the Father, our redemption by the Son, our sustaining by the Spirit, it is all so we are set apart as God's people, his holy temple, to praise and proclaim him in all we do. And when I sit and reflect on all this, suddenly the way that I want things to be doesn't matter so much anymore. In fact, I begin to realize that sometimes the things I want are directly undermining the amazing things God is doing. When we are united in Christ, you no longer appear to me as someone I disagree with on politics, liturgy, dress attire, tradition, or music. Instead, when I think of you, those barriers are gone. When I think of you, I imagine a brother. When I think of you, I imagine a sister. And some people may think that I'm foolish, but I don't believe God made a mistake when he formed the church. The church has always been turbulent, but it has never been a mistake. And I desire so deeply for this church and all churches to be places that praise and proclaim the glory of God. Because we look at all that God has done. When we do that, the story becomes far more important than any of us and how we want things to be. And Paul has reminded us today of what matters most. He has reminded us that we were once far away, but now we are near. We were once without God, 
But now we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were once enemies, but now we are siblings. We were once in hostility, but now we have peace. We were once two, but now we are one. We were once foreigners, but now we are fellow citizens. We were once homeless, but now we are in the household. We were once rebel, but now we are God's temple. We were once separate, but now we are built together. God did all this for us. Out of his love and mercy, he has brought us together. So let us never forget, in the midst of all the potential divisions, what the ultimate truth is. We are united in Christ to bring glory to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for the reminder in Ephesians. It's so easy for us to get wrapped up in so many different parts of Christianity and in the church. We so often want things to be our way. Help us to let go of that. Help us to see what you're doing. Help us to to be flexible, to embrace where you're leading us, because sometimes that means giving up things that we want. But the beauty of that is one thing will never change. We are always united in Christ to bring you glory. So remind us of that. No matter what happens, no matter what disagreements we have, that we are brothers and sisters. That though we were sinners, you brought us into your household. Let us love one another. Let us accept one another. Let us respect one another, no matter what is going on, so the world around us can see that you are deserving of glory. We give you all these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful Father, we offer what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, signs of what you have first given us. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all that is not right within us. Hear us now, O Lord, as we confess to you from the silence of our hearts, our sin, and our brokenness. O God, if you were to keep a record of wrong, who could stand? But we give thanks that with you there is forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, for the sick and the suffering, we pray, especially those that we name before you now. We pray for the healing hand of your Holy Spirit to be upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for who we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remember it was the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took bread. He broke it, he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we prepare to receive communion, let us pray together using the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now to a time of prayer and communion. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. 
sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Fall asleep before the throne Christ And now receive this blessing. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I'm sorry if it's just a lot of me. Uh, We got some people on vacation, relaxing, enjoying some time with family. So, so glad that uh, some of our other pastors can get away and relax. Um, They deserve it. Trust me. I know. I work with them. I definitely know they deserve it. So, and thank you for your support um, for us in our church and watching online. And if you want to get connected with us, uh, feel free to always reach out. We have a connect card. We'd be happy to help you out with getting a group or into a class or what have you. Uh, We do have some Sunday school classes if you're interested in coming back to the church for that. Uh, 10 a.m. service, Pastor Bruce, who's just, you know, awesome. He's got his class going. Nanette and Laura Seasau Suvangs also have a class on apologetics. So if you're interested in those and want to come back to the building, we got those going on. Um, also, of course, we're gonna I'm gonna keep beating this drum. We got kids camp, all right? We got we got Littles Kids Camp. It's for ages uh, three entering to kindergarten. It's gonna be awesome. I mean, I kind of wish I could go, but I got other work to do. And Kay was like, "No, you can't come. I'm so sorry." So you know, it is what it is. But your kid should go, or your grandkid, or your neighbor's kid, somebody's kid, 
they need to be at this because it's going to be a lot of fun. And that's happening the 26th through the 29th. Uh, it is a 9 a.m. to noon affair. So some good morning break for parents, grandparents. Uh, but I encourage you, you can learn more uh, about that on fclc.org backslash kids camp. Uh, but yeah, lots going on. There's always more to learn. fclc.org in general, we got all the things on there. So you got to check it out, all right? Well, as you go today, as you turn off your screens, uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. And uh, as you go, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.